virus removal. Uh, so we're going to talk about our outline, origins of virus, where do they come from, um, how do we get our computers infected with them. Uh, source, uh, we're going to talk about the files themselves, about the virus files themselves, about the source of the files. Um, triggers as far as what makes the virus do what it's supposed to do. For instance, if the virus is supposed to remove your desktop, what actually tells it go do your damage? And then uh, damage, the damage would be removing your desktop or whatever the virus was written to do, okay? So we're going to talk about these topics and where do they come from, how to stop them, how to remove them, how to repair from them, okay? Any questions on the outline? No? All right, so let's get started. First, origins. Uh, viruses themselves, where do they come from? These are the three main places that viruses will come from. Uh, download. Download is the number one. Whoa, back, back. Is the number one way you will get a virus. Now, one thing that you might not know is that when you uh, visit a website, let me draw a little network here. You've got, you know, this is you, okay? And then this is, uh, uh, I don't know, this is a, a website of some site, of some sort. Whenever you visit a website, like let's say the website is Google. Whenever you visit Google, you open up a web browser, right? And then at the top, you type in Google.com. When you type in Google.com, you send a request to Google. Okay, I'm just going to send that in blue. And then Google sends, get, receives the request saying, I want or I need your index page or your main page, your, your source page, the, the beginning of your website, and Google's going to say, oh, okay, you need this HTML file, and you need, what else do you get? You get a picture, right? Uh, so you're going, to get, you're going to get an HTML5 and a, and a picture. So then they get these files, and then they send them through the internet off to your computer. When they get into your computer, Windows or my Internet Explorer, whatever Explorer you're using, they will automatically download to a temporary folder this HTML page and the JPEG that you uh, requested, you know, has the picture in the middle that says Google, right? The HTML page is just squares and letters and telling it how to arrange everything, and then the picture's in the middle. Now, if you were to visit a website that had a lot of pictures and a lot of stuff on it, then you'd have to download all those things. The purpose of this, or the main, the main reason I'm in, I'm talking about it is because whenever you visit a website, any website, whatever website you typed out in the top right there, you gave that website full permission to send you anything they want. Or in other words, anything that's in that web page. Okay? So if in that web page there was a virus hidden in there, guess what you just did? You allowed that website to send you the virus. You allowed that website to download that little virus that was hidden in that web page, okay? Now, would Google's main page have a virus in it? Could it have a virus in it? Could, but probably not. No, it won't, okay? <laughs> they spend a lot of money, okay, making sure that their main page doesn't have a virus, okay? MSN.com, would, would they get a virus in it? Probably not, okay? Fortune 500 companies, they spend a lot of money on development and, you know, and so on to make sure that their sites are secure. If they're a business-oriented company, of course they're going to want you not to get a virus so that you keep coming back for more business, right? Now, what about a website that is maybe inappropriate or has things that you shouldn't have on your computer, like free software, you know, illegitimate software, and so on? Could that possibly have a virus on it? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, it probably could. So. Um, in, this, in, in downloading, it always depends on who the source is. Wh whatever website you're visiting, is that a good website? Is that an appropriate website? Is that a website that is you know, in the for business profit where they're going to make sure that their website is not giving you viruses? Then yes, it probably is. Now here's a misconception somebody might say or might think, <clears throat> excuse me, they might say, I remember, give me a second. <clears throat> they might say, I remember one time I went to Google and I was searching for kitten desktop background pictures and I wound up gotten, getting a virus. Then they probably what they did is they went to Google 
And then they typed out something in the li lines of uh, free kitten pictures or, you know, mycatbackground.com or whatever. And then the, Google then referred them to another company. Whoa, what the heck happened there? Where they visited this third party company that had a different website that probably did have a virus in there hidden somewhere. Okay? Google's like an index, it's not really a website. You know, it's kind of like you know, go to the library, you had the, the index in the front telling you where all the books were. That's what Google is. They're just the index, they're not the websites. So, because you started your search in Google, it doesn't mean that everything that you go to Google is going to be free and clear. Their links are not not by Google. Those aren't verified. They'll just tell you, hey, that's what's out there. If you go there, it's, you know, it's on your own. I'm just telling you what's out there. They're just the index. All right? So this is the number way, one way people download a virus because they start visiting websites that they never visited before or that aren't verified or that aren't trusted. They just start visiting random sites trying to find something that they're looking for. Okay? Um, if you ever came up to somebody and or to a computer that had a virus and they told you, well, I was sitting here playing solitaire and a virus just jumped on there by itself. I was doing absolutely nothing, I was reading the Bible and then all of a sudden all these pornography sites started coming up. Then, yeah, no, that, it doesn't quite work like that. Computers don't think on themselves. They respond to your interaction, okay? Even when you set up timers, it's still your interaction that set up those timers. So there always has to be something that initiates the download. Most of the time, it's you visiting a website, or the user, sorry, visiting a website, okay? They visited a website, that website probably wasn't a good website that sent you a virus, okay? That's the number one way all computers get a virus. Number two way, email. Um, if my buddy Todd here, okay, gets a virus on his computer, who knows how he got a virus? That virus could potentially search his contacts, and I'm one of his contacts, and then his computer would then email me saying, hey, it's me, um, these are pictures from me in Cancun, just click on this link, and then, you know, I'm like, oh, let's see him, you know, upside down on the trees or whatever, you know, uh, click on it, and then it opens up, and instead of a picture, I've got a virus, okay? So, usually email attachments or links will get you a virus. Okay, so whenever you get a, 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 an email from somebody you don't know, first of all, don't open the attachment. It's that simple, okay? Um, if you have a computer scanner, a, vi a virus scanner, make sure that it's scanning your emails as well. Um, if you get a, a link, just verify that that's a good link. It's something that you requested or something that, you know, so on. If it's, something you, if it's somebody you've never talked to in, in years, in 10 years, and all of a sudden you get this, buddy buddy email with a link on it, you know, you might want to call them, hey, did you send me something? They're probably going to tell you, no, but you're the fourth person that asked me that. And then that probably tells you that they probably got a virus that sent it to all their contacts, okay? I have seen it also where a computer infected started emailing itself from its contacts, saying, all these people in my contacts are emailing me, oh, it must be a good thing. Like, they're all saying, hey, I just saw this, this monster dinosaur in Hong Kong, check out the, the video, and, you know, and everybody sent it, like, oh, it must be real, so they, they, they start clicking on it, you know. So, uh, always be careful with the links and attachments. One thing that I like about uh, some email programs, for instance, Outlook, is that when you open up Outlook and you've got your, you know, your emails here, if you click on it, you know, the email pops up and it gives you a preview of the attachment without you even opening it, uh, which is good because if if this says it's corrupted, then I would probably not try to open it with my regular uh, Explorer, okay? Um, so email is number two. Number three is storage devices. Storage devices could be anything from a thumb drive. Okay, see if I have one of my, nope, don't. Uh, a thumb drive that you plugged in from, for instance, if Festus went to Todd's house, because uh, Todd already infected my computer, but now Festus went to Todd's house and he plugged in his USB to his computer, the virus could have jumped onto his USB. Then he goes to your house and he plugs it in, and guess what, you just got the virus. Then he goes to your house and plugs it in, and you got the virus. But he's smart enough not to plug it into his computer. <laughs> so uh, storage devices, whether they're a USB or an external hard drive, and some people don't even think about it, is your phones are USB devices. If you plug in your phone or you go to Todd's house just to charge your phone, you plug it on his computer, well guess what, you could have downloaded the virus here. 
because it's a, it's, a, it's a Windows virus, it might not even affect my phone. My phone might be just running perfect and nothing wrong with it. But as soon as I take my phone and charge to Festus' house now, guess what? Transfer. Now he has the virus and I've transferred it to him, okay? So always be careful with what gets plugged into your computer, okay? Uh, a lot of good virus programs, and we'll talk about those a little later, uh, they'll, they'll actually s scan anything that gets plugged into your computer, whether it's a storage device, a hard drive, a network connection, whatever. They start just scanning it, making sure that everything's good and clear, okay? So we had uh, USB hard disk drives, you know, uh, thumb drives, Ooh. Um, phones, okay, and so on. So any, any other external type storage is one way that it could jump from one to the other, okay? Any questions where viruses come from, okay? Yeah, nobody ever does, yeah. So uh, one thing that uh, some phones started doing is that when you first plug it in, it asks you, hey, do you want to make this a USB storage device so that it doesn't automatically become a USB storage device? So like if you have a Windows phone, I mean an Apple phone and you plug it into a Windows computer, it automatically becomes a USB storage device and viruses can get infected that way. Now again, it won't affect your phone because the virus wasn't written for this operating system. It was written for Windows 7 or you know, Windows computers or so on. Okay? All right, so any questions on the origins of where do they come from? How do I get them in my computer? It's impossible for you to sit there and do absolutely nothing to a computer and then a virus came to you. It's just, it, it's not going to happen. It's, it has to be downloaded or required from some sort of media, okay? Number one being the internet. Sometimes it's a, it's a mixture of one. For instance, sometimes you get an email with a link, then the link sends you to the, e to the website to get downloaded, okay? And so on. So this is the number one way of people downloading viruses. For many, many years, up until actually this year, I didn't have an antivirus on my computer. And people would ask me all the time, like, are you, on your server, you don't have anything? I was like, no, what for? I don't visit websites I don't know. You know, I use my laptop, which is a Mac. Um, I don't get on my server and start surfing. My, win my server is a Windows computer. And start surfing the web. I only visit places that are trusted, that I know, that are verified. So I don't need an antivirus. I don't plug in other people's USB storage devices, so I don't have to worry about that. You know, I don't check my email on it, so I don't worry about that. So I never, I never needed an antivirus. Uh, lately, I started a building more servers, so I started getting on the web and stuff. So uh, now I have an antivirus on it, but for many years I didn't have one because I didn't do any of these things on my server, okay? Um, and in companies, make sure that your servers are also secured because a lot of people think, well, we, let's put the antiviruses just on all the users because the users are the ones that are gonna wind up you know, using up the computers and more, more likely getting the viruses and infecting others. Uh, but sometimes the servers can be prone, prone to them. I had one company that I serviced that they, uh, they were an insurance company and the server was just kind of like in the corner, it wasn't in another room. And then the UPS guy came in and like, hey, can I, can I use your computer to check my email? And the, the, the employees didn't know, they just thought it was just a computer in the corner. They're like, yeah, use that one, nobody ever uses that one, so it doesn't matter if you miss that one up. So you know, and they knew the UPS guy, he's there every day. So he went over there, checked his, his email and then he left. And then like, they called me, like, and I, I walked in, I was like, man, that thing is infected. Like, is anybody even using it? They're like, no, no. And then one person said, oh, yeah, the UPS guy used it. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, this is your server. This is actually the one that controls those computers. They're like, oh, we thought it was an old computer because it's a big box that's bulky and not very nice looking. So we thought it was an old computer that could just be thrown away. It's like, no, backwards. <laughs> so... Make sure your servers are also secure, just in case a user, first of all, don't let your users get to your servers, but uh, make sure that they also have an antivirus themselves. All right, so no questions on origins. Let's talk about the virus effects. Now, now that we've downloaded the virus and gotten it on our computer, how does the virus actually work? Okay. First, there's a source file. The source file is the file that you actually downloaded or got from a USB or you actually acquired somehow. So, so the source file, uh, in this case, we're gonna say we downloaded it. We downloaded, and we're gonna call it, um, I actually once downloaded a, a virus, yes? If we go back for a second, mm -hmm. let's say you actually had one logged in on mm -hmm. this laptop, uh, but it's got cloud storage somewhere, mm -hmm. whatever company, wouldn't it also affect that? Um, yes and no. 
let me backtrack just a little bit. So I've got this computer, okay. This is no longer you, this is now Todd. Todd, sorry, you got a you got promoted into the virus man. Okay. So there's Todd. Todd got a virus on his computer because he visited a website trying to download free kit and backgrounds. Okay. But Todd also has a cloud storage software or cloud storage account with give me one. Anybody? Google Drive, okay. So he has a Google Drive account, which is just cloud storage. And if anybody doesn't know what cloud means, especially out there, cloud means internet, that's all. Nothing else, nothing fancy. It's not some super different technology. We used to call it the World Wide Web, then we just called it the web, then we called it the internet, now we call it the cloud, it's marketing. All right, so he's got a Google account that has two gigs of free space, right? So you've got the virus, and a lot of times what the viruses do is they affect anything that's plugged into, including your network connection. So if Todd had another computer, you know, it would probably get infected over there too. And then they'll try to infect the Google Drive as well, but Google on their servers also have antivirus, uh, antiviruses installed. So the antivirus on here might kick off that virus and prevent it from getting installed onto his Google Drive account. And a lot of cloud services, they'll do that for you because they don't want Todd to uh, infect the server and then infect all the other users of that cloud service. Because when you have a cloud storage, you're actually just, you have shared space. It's kind of like having a hard drive with your folder and then a, a limit of uh, how much storage you can use. But there's other folders for other users. So they wouldn't want one user to infect hundreds of other users. So they would make sure that you can't upload or you can't store a virus. It's kind of like nowadays when you try to email somebody a file and it's an installer file, they're like, eh, can't, can't email that kind of file because they don't know if it's a virus. Okay? So a lot of preventive measures for the cloud. A lot of times the cloud's actually even more, more secure than your home, your home user, because your home user will get probably a free antivirus or a cheap antivirus and then probably not maintain it or update it. A lot of people, they wind up getting a... A, a subscription to one of the antiviruses and only pay for it one year, and then they think they're, they're still being protected, <coughs> you know, if they stop, if they don't keep paying every year. So the big companies, they'll actually pay for big, massive software so that it's very, very secure, make sure that nothing gets uploaded into their, their accounts. So yes and no, it could, but a lot of those companies, they'll make sure that they're secure so that it doesn't affect other users. There, there is, there always will be, um, because you know, if the, a lot of people who come up with viruses, they're just people in their home, they're just, you know, for, for whatever reasons. Uh, but a lot of companies, they hire those virus developers to be their antivirus developers. Um, and that's just kind of how it works, it's kind of weird how that started, is that the, the hacking community, uh, one person started gloating and then they started inviting the police agencies to come look what I can do and so on and it's grown into this big massive thing in Vegas where all the top agencies of the world and then all the top you know hackers and virus developers in the world get together in this convention and a lot of them get hired you know so there have actually been people who created a virus to get hired and then they get hired and they don't know how to remove the virus or they sell the code of the virus so that they know how to prevent it. Um, it's kind of a, one of those weird deals where, yeah, you'd say, isn't that illegal? But in the rules are still kind of funny <laughs> about that. So it's like, it's not illegal for you to develop software. You know, it's illegal for you to develop software that steals people's security codes, you know, their security uh, uh, numbers uh, and so on. So it depends, it's like the rules are kind of funny that way. It's kind of like the whole internet sharing. It's not illegal for you to create a peer-to-peer -peer software but it's illegal for you to put copyrighted software on that program. So just because you made a virus doesn't mean that the purpose of it is illegal. Does that make sense? It goes back to the whole gun thing. You know, it's not illegal to make guns or shoot them or anything, but it is illegal to point it at somebody else and shoot them. Uh, so not in Texas. Not in Texas. Not there, not there in your property. That's how we row. <laughs> um, so uh, again, it's kind of funny there. and. There, there'll always be some kind of delay 
it's very, very minimal because even though there's one person creating a, a virus, companies like McAfee, Avast, and so on, they have teams of people creating antivirus and make sure they're updated and so on and so on and so on. No, not really. Um, now, that what there will be is update, update uh, virus update definition lags, because not everybody does their updates daily. So even though a new virus came out today on the 5th, and then on the 6th, the uh, antivirus security update came out, people might not update until the 20th, you know? It just depends on how their software was set up, how their connection set up, you know, and so on. So. Uh, is not just the lag of when it came out, but more importantly is when Todd got it installed on his computer, you know? Not just that, but when the company finds out, I mean, they buy it in, they start selling it. It's like somebody coming here with Ebola. Yeah. And you don't know. Yeah. So, so they, what, they, what they do is they spend a lot of money on kind of making new updates, trying to stop them before they ever come out. But that's, I mean, you're talking, now you're talking about their business model now. That's what they do, yeah. So... Um, all right, moving forward. So we were talking about our, our uh, trifecta here, or the, uh, the virus effect. Um, and we're gonna download a file. Um, I once downloaded a file called a regular plugin. .exe, okay? And I was on my Mac, and it actually just popped up on my desktop. and went, boop, regular plugin .exe, or .dll, sorry. And I just, I clicked on it and hit delete, and that was the end of it. All right, so we've downloaded the, the virus, the file itself. Now, the file itself doesn't actually do any damage until it starts doing its damage, until something tells it, all right, go. You know? um, so that brings us down to the trigger. Sometimes people know exactly when they downloaded a virus. Sometimes people say, um, I visited this website, and like two seconds later, all these pornographic websites started popping up automatically. Or all these um, um, links started showing up on my desktop, or, or all of a sudden all these FBI warnings started coming out, or you know, so on. They, it's immediate, okay? That's an auto run trigger, which means As soon as you're presented with an operating system, auto run. Do whatever you've got to do, okay? A lot of viruses are actually getting away from that. Why? Because you know which website is the bad website. You know what website never to visit again, okay? Um, some people download a virus and they don't realize they've downloaded a virus until days later, weeks later, months later, maybe the next time they restart their computer. You know, Maybe if they don't boot up their, they don't turn off their computer and restart, but once a week, then they don't know when they got the virus because the trigger wasn't set up until, hey, the next time this computer turns on, do your damage. That was the trigger. The trigger was set up at the next restart, okay? And every time you restart this computer, do your damage, okay? Um, so that, that's another one. Another one could be at login. Whoa. So when I restart my computer, but instead of me logging in, he logs in, it doesn't affect. But when I log in, the virus actually does what it needs to do. Okay? So these are different triggers that viruses are, are written to do their damage. Sometimes they do all of them. Sometimes they say, as soon as you get in the system, do your damage. And then when they reboot, do your damage again. And then when they reboot, do your damage again. And when they log in, do the damage again. Okay? They have multiple triggers to keep itself infected, okay? This, in, in other words, this would be the, uh, the go time. This is the actually go do your damage type time, okay? Number three brings us over to the damage, okay? This is the actual problem. This is the actual thing that you see. So far, you didn't see anything. A lot of the time, these, uh, these files that you download, they get hidden inside the Windows folder or inside your application folder or inside your app data folder or so on, somewhere you can't see it. They're not gonna put it on your desktop saying, here's the virus, okay? Um, so they'll get hidden and then the trigger depends on, and I'm gonna show you where the triggers are, depending on what kind of trigger they set up. <coughs> Sorry, just did the other lecture, so. 
I get dry. All right, so um, depending on where the, what trigger they set up, you won't actually see it, okay? The damage is what everybody always sees. For instance, has anybody ever known somebody or has anybody ever gotten a virus on their computer? Right. Yes? Well, what did it do? What were some of the things that it do? Mine did not suggest an advert. For example, just something pops up and says Oh, that. ads? Uh -huh. Okay. Probably things they, they want you to buy or something. What, what have you seen? Uh, change the, the search engine. On the search engine, okay. And probably, as well as the search engine, change all your websites. Are they all funneled to the same website, maybe? Okay. The web surfing. They probably proxied another website. So you go to Google, but it actually takes you to the website. Well, on, on a program, when I hit help, it mm -hmm. went to the web page that it wanted to go to. Uh-huh. Okay. Have you, have you seen? What kind of damage have you seen? Maybe it was the end of the ad thing that tried to get you to buy. Buy, yeah. There's, there's. there's <laughs> My, my, my dad one time got a virus called security, it was a program that looked like an antivirus, but it was actually a virus. It was a security, what was it called? Um, Windows Security 2012 or something like that. And I was like, well dad, Windows doesn't make a program called Windows Security 2012. Um, but anyways, he didn't call me. He, 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 uh, he was kind of ashamed that he got a virus. And, and I'm always busy, you know, he, every time he calls me, I'm like, oh sorry dad, I'm in Boston, I'm in Maryland, wherever. Um, so he, he tries to never call me. So this, this program came up and it said, we found 776 viruses on your computer, you know, for $39.99, we clean it all up. So guess what he did? It's like, oh, no problem, $39.99, <laughs> done with it, you know? So, so yeah, so he paid it and sure enough, it went away. It's like, yeah, it got quick. It's like, man, I'm glad I got this program. And then, <laughs> and then next month, guess what happened? We found 779 viruses. $39.99 and we get rid of them. So then that time, the second time, I think he was like, I just paid this, what do I gotta pay again? And then, uh, then he finally called me. And like, dad, do you know who I am? I mean, when I tell people that, yeah, my dad gets viruses and he pays for them, you know, that's, what's that gonna make it look like? Just call me. So, so he's like, yeah, I didn't wanna bother you and so on. So I went, I told him, just turn it off, I'll be there in the weekend. And when I got there, sure enough, it was the virus. It was the program was the virus. And it was just trying to, you know, and there's some people that will. They, they don't know who to call. They'll just keep paying the $39.99 to, you know, keep getting their viruses removed um, and so on. So, yeah, there's just, there's sometimes it's websites that they try to get you to go to, and sometimes it's a program that makes it look like an antivirus, okay? Um, so what other kind of damage have you ever seen or heard of from people? What's that? Okay, key loggers, they're, they're trying to get some of your information, maybe your banking information, passwords, or so on. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the um, hidden icons, very popular. It, just, it looks like everything's gone, but it's just hidden, right? Um, I've seen ones that have blocked the desktop, picture on the desktop, um, so desktop background. Um, I've seen, uh, have you ever, anybody heard or seen the, the FBI one? A little a window screen takes up over your full screen and says, the FBI is tracking your computer. And if you have a, a laptop with a webcam, it actually takes a picture of you and puts it on there. Like, the FBI is tracking you and it has your picture. And then it says, uh, your IP address is so and so. And if you, uh, I had a friend, one of my dad's friends that, that got this FBI thing and says, uh, um, this computer has been linked to I forgot what they said, uh, inappropriate or something, uh, some other thing, and then at the bottom said, uh, to avoid being arrested and the FBI, uh, F to avoid the FBI arresting you, pay $499 for, uh, $400 or $500 for, for you to prevent from being arrested. And he called me, he was distraught, he was like, hey Jay, the FBI's uh, on my computer, and uh, I, I'm, I'm about to go, go get this, uh, this thing that they told me to get at Albertsons, this card to, to pay, because I don't want the, the FBI to come to my house. And then $500 is not a problem. I'll, I'll just pay it and, and get, get, get done with it. And I told them, well, uh, Larry, his name is Larry. Larry, the, um, first of all, when the police say, give me money and I won't arrest you, it's called a bribe. And, when they, and if it's the FBI, they, they wouldn't ask for $500. 
for a bribe. <laughs> so I was like, don't worry about it. He's like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, I'm sure. Just unplug it from the wall. I'll be there in the weekend and take a look at it. Um, and, you know, he was worried. He'd never seen something like that before. So when I got there, sure enough, it was a virus. Just a couple, like an hour or so, I wound up getting it all cleaned up and, and ready for him again. So uh, that was kind of a mixture of, you know, asking for money and so on. All right, so there's all sorts of things that, that you will see with viruses, okay? Performance, uh, yeah, uh, this the performance usually has to do with two things. Um, oh, uh, performance, then they'll probably tell you how to fix it. You know, speed up my computer and for so much, so much, so much, and so on. Um, so there, there'll be a combination of things. Um, some of them are just there to, to hurt you, just to make a computer crash or, you know, just to do damage. Others are trying to get something out of it, whether it's your information, whether it's money, you know, or so on. Uh, the point is that whenever a tech is called and, and they tell you, hey, I have a computer here, and then now st step away from this lecture and just think about the first time somebody told you I have a, a virus or if you ever got a virus. And when you opened up your computer, you saw, you know, maybe uh, some pornographic things, you know, pornographic, you know, th things on your computer. The first thing you want to do is like, oh, I need to fix this, right? There's something wrong with it. There's a bunch of Everything's gone, and all I see is these links to these improper websites, and you know we've got to get this computer back in for running. So what's the first thing you want to do? What's the first thing that all techs want to do? What's that? Yeah, get rid of the damage. Yeah, they're like, well, this is the problem here. Let's get rid of the damage. And, and there's people they do. They they highlight all their links and throw them in the trash, right? And then to to unhide their icons, they turn on the hidden items, highlight everything, and unhide it, take the hidden feature, put the desktop picture, change it back to what it used to be, you know, and start putting everything back together, you know, get rid of the ads, change the proxies that keeps, you know, changing the website to that other website that, you know, reset your proxies and your Internet Explorer, and, and then they're done. But guess what happens? Guess what happens the next time they restart their computer? It all happens again. Everybody, every tech that's not really saw, sad and thought, thought about it, they always want to take care of the damage first. The damage is the least of your worries, okay? The la damage is the last thing we're going to do. The way that you got it is you got the source file, you download, you, it triggered, and then it did its damage. But the first thing we always want to do is stop the trigger. This is the number one thing you want to do. Because it's pointless for you to fix the damage if the trigger is going to do it all over again, okay? Once you've stopped the trigger, you want to delete the source file. A lot of the times, they'll be back, in, back to back. Because if you can find the trigger, it will tell you where that source file is. Okay? And then the last thing you want to do is fix the damage. Okay? The fixing the damage is always the last thing. Because again, you don't want to get stuck in a never-ending circle where you're fixing the desktop picture, and then it happens again, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these. Let me just jump forward. All right, so we're going to take a look at fixing the trigger. So there's, there's three main places, and this is one thing that I love about Windows 7 and Windows Vista, is that they, they really centralized these triggers. Windows XP was great, but you know, Windows XP existed in an age where antivirus really, I mean, viruses weren't really very popular as they are today. So there wasn't that many you know, necessities to make all these extra features. Um, but nowadays, you know, virus is kind of a big deal. No matter what part of the computer industry you work at, you're going to wind up getting a virus one way or the other, or one of your users that you manage is going to wind up getting a virus. So let's take a look at these three. The first one's auto run. First one's pretty simple. Um, auto run is something that's kind of gone away because, again, they don't want you to know where you got the virus from, right? And it's, it's actually the auto run is part of the actual file that gets downloaded. Um, the next two, restart and login, can be in two different places. And let's go ahead and turn the page here. And we're going to start looking at where do these things happen. Okay? The first one we're going to look at is the MS config. If, it's the, if the trigger is set up at startup, the MS config or the system configuration window has a tab called startup that anything in your computer that will run as soon as you turn on that computer has to be in this window. And that's, again, this is something that Windows Vista and 7 did. They centralize it so that everything has to be together. Okay, anybody knows how to get to the system configuration window? Start. You can just type it right there. If you have a Windows XP, just type in <coughs> MS config. Enter. Mm. 
All right, so there it is. We're in the system configuration window. We're going to go to the startup tab right there. And then these are all the things that start up as soon as your computer turns on. Uh, throughout all the PC Clinic lectures, I will, we'll, we'll actually come back to, to this tab uh, during the boot issues and, and performance and speed and so on. We'll always come back to this tab because it has a lot to, lot to do with a lot of things. Because think about it. As soon as I turn on my computer, all this is going to happen. You know, that's many things that can be solved from this one window. So the way you look at this is, first of all, there's a description. Okay, this first one, startup item. It's just a description. And believe me when I tell you that a virus isn't going to announce itself, hey, this is a virus. It's not going to actually say on there, virus. It's probably going to say something like Intel product or uh, wireless support or you know, something that's going to make you think, oh, that's supposed to be there. Okay? I will tell you this, though. When you first install Windows from scratch with nothing else, not even drivers, just Windows by itself, this is empty. There's absolutely nothing on here that Windows absolutely needs in there to, for, to, for it to work. There might be some things that you might need to work, for instance, your device drivers and so on, but nothing. when you first install Windows, this is empty. So it's perfectly fine to hit disable all down here and restart your computer. And that's technically, uh, typically what I usually do when I'm very first presented with a computer with a virus. I'll try to get to this window. If I can't get to this window, I'll try to go through safe mode to get to this window. And if I can get to this window, I'll disable all restart the computer, and a lot of times the virus doesn't even know that the computer's on. The virus has, doesn't have the go trigger. The file is there, but it doesn't have that go trigger to do its damage because it doesn't know the computer's on. Because this, this would be the go trigger right here. All right, so um, with time, you will kind of find out what's supposed to be there and what's not supposed to be there. When, when you go through this, um, you know, it says Intel Common, Intel Common manufacturer here. These two kind of run together because you have to have a manufacturer uh, with, that's a registered with uh, Microsoft to be on this list. If it has nothing, like if it's blank or it says unknown, then that's kind of a red flag. See, unknown, unknown, and so on. Um, so, for instance, here it tells you that it's something with Intel. This tells you the S set endpoint security. This tells you how to do something with Microsoft Office. So they give you kind of a little bit of a description of what it's for. Um, when we go through computers together with viruses, we'll spend some time here, and I'll tell you this looks suspicious, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, the next tab here after the manufacturer we have is the command. The command tab is actually where is it located on the C drive, on my hard drive. And guess what this is? Guess what that is right here? That is the source file. This is the source file that is being launched when the computer first turns on. And you see that some of these are pretty long. I'm going to stop right there. See that one? Uh, JUSBMON.exe. That is the actual file that launches when the computer first turns on. So this window gives you both the trigger and the source file, as you can see. You just follow that path, C, program files, you know, CC, computer, C, move this over here. So program files, x86, and then Intel, Intel, so where's uh, Intel, Intel, and what is it called? Uh, Intel, then Intel R management engine components, Intel R management engine components. And then IMSS, IMSS, and then PI cons. There it is. And see, there is the file. We have just found the file using this path right here. And now that is that right there, whatever this has to do with startup. Now, sometimes your drivers, your device drivers, will put things on here. Uh, sometimes it will be you know, a, a piece of hardware, for instance. This computer has a lot of this uh, starboard software because, you know, it's the touchboard software that, you know, there's, there's light sensors on it. There's, you'll see a bunch of stuff on here, delay launch, starboard software, uh, that, um, fight manager, you know, a couple of other things. These all have to do with this board right here. Um, so sometimes we've got to kind of be careful on what you're, what you're de erasing there. Uh, it's always smart to uh, make a backup of the, the image before you start modifying it in case you wind up getting rid of it, especially if it's a work computer that does something very specific, like 
uh, a QuickBooks computer or a computer for like here for the financial aid computer has specialty software on it or so on. Be when you're dealing with specialty software, you never know what components that software needs. So now in this case, if I was to hit disable all, hit OK and restart my computer, that will not uninstall it from my computer. All that would do is, is tell the computer, when you turn on, this software does not run. Okay, don't run the software when I turn on this computer. You have not uninstalled it from the computer, and you have not blocked the software. You can still manually go in there and turn on the software. For instance, um, I saw the Apple thing on here. Where is it at? Uh, QuickTime. So if I was to hit disable, oh, okay, restart my computer, that means that when I first turn on my computer, QuickTime down here won't automatically see all these programs that are launched. All of these programs are on this list. So when I restart my computer, QuickTime won't actually launch. Or another one would be this uh, Microsoft Link. Microsoft Link, and I thought I just saw it there. Uh, maybe not. So uh, that program won't actually run when my computer turns on, but I can still go to Start, find the program, click on it, and run it that way. So by disabling all, I didn't uninstall it. I didn't prevent it from running. I just told it, don't run when I turn on the computer. Don't launch yourself. Just wait. Just stay there until you're needed. Okay? Uh, so it's perfectly safe to hit disable all. Now, if you come this way, if you find the file, then you go that way and delete it. You've removed that software from the computer. So the go trigger will say go, but there will be no file to actually go do its damage. Okay? The last tab right here. This is where the trigger is in the registry hive. Because if you've taken the registry lecture, you've learned that the registry are just settings. Okay? So this right here is in the registry. Where does this line exist? Because I can disable this line. right? I can hit disable, take the check mark off, and I can erase the program. But sometimes this line it actually stays there. This line is actually still in here. To get rid of this line, you would actually go to the registry, uh, the local machine. See that LM? That means local machine. Software, that, that key, that key, that key, that key. Under the run, you will find this name. And then you can remove it that way. You just right click on it, delete the key, and be done. Okay? So the M system configuration window, very powerful. You can disable a lot of viruses from here. A lot of the viruses will come to this window because this is a very good way to affect this computer regardless of who logs in, regardless if you turn on the computer and you don't log in. Because sometimes on the server, you turn on the server, but you won't log in. You just leave it running in the background to do its services. Uh, so this way, it will affect that computer because it's turned on. That's a startup. OK? And how did you get to that again? Cancel. Anybody? Remember? Start. MS config right there. If this was a uh, Windows XP, you can go to run, you know, the run window right here, and then type it in the run. Okay. Let's go right there. You can also do that from the command prompt. Um, what do you mean? Command prompt. No, not from the command prompt. Where did I leave my pen? Oh. So I went to start. And then I typed in MS config, and then I went to the startup tab. Okay? So this affects if the trigger is in the startup. And again, a lot of them will be in the startup. A lot of viruses go to the startup because it's guaranteed to affect your computer. Um, now, the login. Login is user specific. Okay? That means only when this one user logs in affect the computer. Okay? So it will be under your user profiles. This is, this is a good way to affect the computer. This is a good way to affect the domain computer. Because if a domain computer has a roaming profile, that means the profile gets saved onto the server. So if you download it to my documents, it automatically will get saved onto the server when you, when you log off. Okay? So uh, the startup folder is located under Start. And then there's a folder actually called up Startup. So let's look at that. So we go to start. All pro I forgot about all programs. And then you, there's a folder actually called oh, startup right there. Okay. And every user has their own startup folder. Okay. So let's go and look at that. So in this case, smart board here, computer, C, whoa, 
C drive, users. So you see this lecture room A? That's this user right here, SmartBoard, right there. Now, there's Jackie has logged into the computer. Garth has logged into this computer. A local admin is logged into this computer. Dell admin, uh, admin star, that's Russell. And then admin Macias, that's Lee in uh, Sacramento. All these people have logged into this computer. Okay? Each one of those guys has their own startup folder. So if Russell has the virus on his computer, it'll follow him here when he logged in. Okay? Um, you see this default? This is known, the default, and in Windows XP and other versions, it was called all users. It's a, it has its own startup folder that affects all the users, literally all the users. So if you create a new user, it gets added to theirs. Okay? If, a, if a user that's never logged in before here logs in here, it'll affect them. Okay? So it'll be under their startup folder. Uh, let's see if I can remember how to get there. Local, Microsoft, Windows. Nope. Uh oh. That's not it. Okay. Hmm. Start menu. Programs. Okay. So it should be in here. If I make a startup folder here, it will affect all the users. Okay. So, and I shouldn't have access to get, I guess I do, have access to get into other people's accounts, cards. Oh, look at that. We can look at his documents. App data, roaming, Microsoft, and startup. Mm, not in here. I don't know, start menu. Can't remember the path to get to the start menu, to the startup. But anyways, each one of these uh, users has their own startup folder that affects just that one user, okay? Um, so if you log in as the user that has the problem, usually under safe mode because the, most of the time the viruses don't know the, the computer's running, uh, just go to the startup and whatever you've got in there, you can just right click on it, delete it, and be done with it. Oh, I clicked on the, fi on the file. Another thing you could do is right click on the startup folder and then uh, open, and it brings it up. Now, you see how that's empty? My startup folder's empty. This startup right here, see this guy right here? This is actually under the default, under the all users. So I'm going to right click on that and see if I can open the file location. And see, that's, uh, that's why I couldn't find it right there. It's uh, affecting all the users, which is that file right there. Okay. So that's another good way to find uh, the problem by right click on it, open file location, and it'll take you directly to where that file is and it'll highlight it for you. So now if that was a virus, I would just hit the delete key, get it off my computer, okay? All right, moving on to the next one. Services, now services are something that runs, again, automatic. It can either run at automatic or at startup, and then it's going to look at that. So start, I can either type in just services right here, or I can go the long way to control panel, administrative tools, services. Okay. All right, it probably won't let me start and stop services because I'm not logged in as an admin. Oh, here, tell you what. Right click, run as admin. All right, so here, here we have our services, all the services that the computer uses to run. Um, it can also be found under the MS config window. If I go to the MS config, this will pull up the main services, but not all the services. So you see the services tab right there? So here's the services right there, and it tells you whether they're running or they're stopped. Okay. You also have a little button here that says hide all the Microsoft services, so it shows you everything that's not Microsoft, okay, which is that right there. Okay. Um, you can use this window or that window 
to go through the services, read them, kind of see what they do. You can stop the services if it messes up something, like you're printing or something. You can just come back and turn it back on, okay? Um, so here, they're, they're little, this way they're a little bit more precise. For instance, if I didn't know what this was, so I can double click on it. It gives me a little bit of a description of what it's for, what it does. It tells me whether it starts manually when you run the program or automatically when I start the computer. Um, it also tells me what I really like is um, over way over here in the dependencies, it tells me when this service runs or when it doesn't run, it affects these other services. Okay? Or if this service down here is not running, I can't run. So who I depend on, who depend on me. Okay? So the dependencies. If a, a virus will usually just be by itself. Nobody would depend on it, and it will not depend on anybody. Okay? It will usually just run by itself. Now, sometimes viruses are intricate. They'll have one attached to another, attached to another, and so on. So if you find the first one, you can come in here, see who depends on him, and then go affect that. For instance, your virus might disable your desktop, hide your icons, change your proxies, and do a couple other things all at once. So they could have its own dependencies. All right, so uh, that's under services. All right, so these are the, the most popular triggers. Uh, one is under the, uh, the uh, MS config, and then the other one's under the services under the, uh, under the administrative tools. All right, now the source files. Where are the files actually? How can I get rid of the file itself? Now that I stopped the trigger and I told the, the, the virus not to go, how can I get rid of the file, number two? So first of all, we looked at the MS config fig window under the startup tab, how we can see the file structure. Remember when it was the C drive and then the program files and so on and so on and so forth? That's one way that you can find the file to get rid of it, okay? Um, in the same startup tab, we had the registry settings, okay? when it was said H key, local machine, and then, you know, so on, so on, so on. That is another place where you can find it in the registry, okay, manually. Uh, the other two are a little bit more simpler. One is the virus scans. Uh, virus scans are made by the virus pr program that you have installed. There's a lot of free home versions, and there's a lot of paid server versions, and so on. It just depends on how good it is. Virus, virus programs I like to compare them to a bulletproof vest, okay? Um, a virus program is a bu bulletproof vest, the bullet being the virus, right? There are some very thick, very good, very strong bulletproof vest that you can shoot with a 45 Magnum and you'll be perfectly fine, but it's gonna slow you down quite a bit, right? Okay? Versus if you get a very light, a very simple antivirus, it's gonna be a very thin bulletproof vest, which your computer can run, it can move really fast, but a 45 bullet might go through it, okay? Um, so it's the level of protection is what I'm trying to get to. There's some virus programs that are so strong and so thick that they actually are too much. They slow down your computer. They use up all your processor. They use up all your memory to do their, their thing. Then there's other programs that they don't use enough to try to keep your computer quick, but they're more vulnerable to a virus. So there's a perfect balance, and it depends on your usage, depends on what kind of antivirus you want, depends on your usage, and it depends on your computer. I'm not a big fan of the, uh, the big McAfee and um, Norton because they're really good antiviruses. They're really thick. They'll use up all your processor and all your RAM. Um, I'm a, I am a fan of Avast, although they are trying to get to that point where they're trying to do too much. It's an all-in-one scanner. Uh, I'll explain quickly kind of what uh, antivirus programs do in the background when they scan. First of all, if, if, uh, if Todd was the computer and I was the antivirus program, um, I would search everything that comes in. So if you bring in a file, whether it's downloading email through a thumb drive, whatever, every file that comes in, I will scan it, no virus, okay, then I'll give it to the computer, to Todd, and then he can do his business with it. And when he sends it back, I'll grab it, I'll search it, and then I'll send it off to email. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of like the mediator. I'm the, the virus program that takes care of everything incoming and outgoing. At the same time, Todd has a hard drive, which would be a filing cabinet over here. At the same time that I'm checking all the packets coming in, coming out, I'm checking the filing cabinet, all the files, making sure none of those files are infected. Okay? At the same time, I'm checking the back doors, making sure that nobody's trying to send something in through 
one of the network connections or through anything else in the background, okay? When I'm done scanning, there's some programs that they won't scan again for a good while. They'll, they'll just leave it. They'll scan everything coming out going. They'll leave that back there, okay? There's other programs that as soon as it's done scanning, it'll start all over again. It'll just, it's a non-stopping cycle of just scanning every single file. So again, it depends on the program and how strong of an antivirus you want versus how strong of an antivirus you need and, and that your computer can handle that you would choose which is the proper antivirus for you. When you're dealing with servers, you obviously want something that's going to be scanning continuously because multiple people will be accessing at all times. If you're talking about a home user that only checks their email once a week, once a day, you might not need something so strong because, first of all, their computer might not have enough RAM and processor to keep their computer quick. Okay? All right. Um, it's always good to make sure you run scans and to schedule scans. Uh, most of the time, you'll hear people say to schedule scans in the middle of the night or middle of the morning, in the, you know, 5 a.m. or something like that. That is good, but for a home user, probably not a good idea. Why? Because a lot of home users probably won't leave their computers on at 5 a.m. So at 10 a.m. when they need to quickly get on the internet and purchase a flight ticket, they turn on their computer and the computer's trying to scan the scan that it missed at 5 a.m. So it's going to take them forever to do something quickly that they need to do. Business computers, train your users not to turn off their computers at the end of the day. They might be used to it because at home, when they're done with the computer, they turn it off. But in businesses, you want them to leave them on, on at night. At night is when you set up your updates, your scans, your, you know, everything else that you need to do. So uh, for businesses, you do schedule your, your, your scans in the middle of the night and train your users not to turn off their computers. Most, most companies are not going to laptop browse, so it's kind of the same. Some companies, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, and then if they, if they give you a laptop, then uh, it's probably set up to do scans all the time as well. Uh, another one, program uninstalls. Uh, remember that program I tell you my dad got, got in his computer? It was an actual program. It had its own full features of programs. It was under the programs and features, and I had to uninstall it that way. Uh, so sometimes this will help too. Um, there's also a very good piece of software called the Revo, R-E-V-O, uninstaller, which I love. There's two versions. There's a home version for home users, and there's a pro version that they give you a 60-day trial. Um, this program is by far one of the best programs to uninstall software. Why? Because sometimes programs, believe it or not, they don't want to get uninstalled. So you hit the uninstall and it's not doing anything and it's just you're clicking and clicking and it doesn't want to uninstall. Um, or sometimes they get so messed up in the registry and other settings that you can't uninstall. They error out. This program will forcibly uninstall everything. And then it will scan your registry and remove everything that was attached to it. Then it'll scan your hard drive and remove all the files that were attached to it. So it's a, it's a very good program. I've never had a problem with a program uninstalling with this software right here. Okay? If, if I'm using it in a business, I'll just download the trial version, use it for 60 days, and then uninstall it. Um, if it's a home user, you can just get the home version, which is free, and just uninstall it that way. Okay? All right, so any questions on getting rid of the file? Number two, getting rid of the actual virus file itself. No? All right, number three, damages. Now, they're going to be all sorts of, as we saw earlier, we just started naming a few, and we saw that there were one more, we, all sorts of damages that it could do. And this is going to be probably the hardest thing that we do, is fixing the damage. Because sometimes it'll, be, it'll mess up Windows, and Windows itself won't work. Windows will have some kind of issue that it, it no longer runs properly. So. Depending on your damage, your damage can affect your, the boot of the computer, turning on the computer. It won't properly turn on. We'll use tools such as the uh, recovery CD. Okay, we can use that. Uh, we can use tools such as uh, system restores. Okay. We can use tools as the startup uh, recovery. Uh, start up recovery. Um, we can use other tools, you know, maybe a backup, there's a backup or so on, uh, there'll be, there's a whole lecture where we talk about boot issues and how to get your computer back up and running, okay? So for this, you can watch boot issues, which is now a lecture on demand, by the way, okay? Boot issues, okay? Um, next one is login. Now login, things that affect your login will be things such as um, 
your desktop background, your hidden icons, uh, maybe some of the ads, uh, the key loggers. Uh, those things are, are, are boot or are login related. They're related to your user and your user profile. One of the, this is kind of hard to, it's kind of a little hard balance to do, but one of the easiest things I've ever found to do is to just make a new user and then delete the old user. So what I do is, if, if there was a user called Alice that has a virus, I'd probably, you know, say A keys, if her last name was keys, um, make a new user called A keys, transfer all their pictures, right? All their documents, you know, their, their favorites, you know, all that stuff, and then just delete this user entirely. The reason is that if it hit every one of her icons, I mean, that's a, hundreds of icons that you'd have to highlight, unhide, highlight, unhide, unhide. Um, or if it messed up their start menu, because I've seen some that mess up their start menu, their taskbar, different things. Uh, sometimes it's easier just to transfer their files now, you don't want to create this user before you get rid of the trigger. Why? Because the, the, the new user will be infected as well. <laughs> so once you've cleaned up the triggers and the, and, the, and the source files, then create the new user, transfer their files over. It will fix a lot of your login issues. I've found this to be one of the best things you can do. Because uh, when, it's, when it creates the login from scratch, it will fix any files that it's missing you know, and so on. The last one is programs and services. Things that would be related to programs and services would be things such as your performance. Um, I don't know what that says. Pornographic. Uh, your search engine, the key loggers, maybe some of the money things. Uh, these things are all related to the actual services or the actual windows or the actual uh, programs that are on your computer. Uh, now this one would be a lot harder to fix. Okay. We'll fix them together. We'll just take them one at a time. Um, we can't really go through every piece of damage that you'll see because there'll be so many different ones. And, and together we'll sit down and I'll show you how to do. First we'll attack two, I mean one, which is the triggers, then two, the source files, and then I'll sit together with you and I'll tell you everything you've got to do to get to all, your computer back up and running again, okay? A, a lot of the times we'll use the disk, the installation disk, to, to put any program or any uh, service that is on the, the that's not on the hard drive that's supposed to be on the hard drive and then copy it back onto the hard drive where it's supposed to be okay uh, that's one of the things we'll do quite a bit all right any question on fixing damages well I mean I know there might be questions but specific questions we'll handle them one at a time when they come in through the PC clinic okay any questions in general over so, the uh, sometimes somebody just tells you that uh, Mm -hmm. so do you, do you we'll sit together and uh, one thing that I always ask the end user is what does it do that it's not supposed to do or what does it not do that it is supposed to do? Like why do you think it has a virus? And then depending on their answer, it will, if they tell me, well, it takes forever to turn on. And like, yeah, it probably doesn't have a virus. It's probably just a performance issue. Um, if it tells me, well, it pops up with uh, this website anytime I try to go to any other website, well, then yeah, it probably has a virus. Uh, so depending on the response. But most of the people just think that it's a virus once uh, you know, if it, it Yeah. And it could be. A lot of times they just have too much software on there. We have a lecture called the Speed, speed Boost that we talk specifically about that because a lot of times people do confuse a slow computer with a virus. You know? But we talk about how to make a computer performance faster you know, and how to minimize usage and so on. Okay. Anything else? All right, so there's the virus effects. Um, we usually download this way, right? But we always want to take care of the triggers first, then the source file, then the damage, okay? And we'll do them together. The more you do with me, uh, one thing that you'll see me do a lot in PC Clinic is talk out loud. I always, always tell you, I see, you see this, I, this is doing this, and I think this is the problem because so-and-so, and then I'll tell you how to fix it. Uh, the hardest part will always be the diagnose, figuring out what's really wrong. And that's the part I'll do with you. And the more that we do together, the more that you start kind of seeing how it's supposed to work and how, it, you know, how to diagnose it yourself. Because once you know the diagnosis, the easy part, you know, I'll tell you, do this, this, and this to fix that. But then that might not be the issue, or, or it might be a series of issues that are put together. Okay? All right. Well, that concludes our lecture. Um, anything for me to sign?
If you have a chance, please fill out a lecture survey at any of the campuses that you are. Fill out the sign-in sheet as well. Did you fill this out already for this lecture? Yeah. Okay. Did y'all already fill this out? No, y'all. Y'all are on it. All right. All right.